Hey everyone, welcome back to Imaginary Lines. This is episode five of your favorite podcast. I am one of your hosts, Keith Giles, I'm an author and podcaster and all kinds of things. And I'm joined by my good friend, the amazing, talented, wise poet, uh, scholar, Daryl Epp. And uh, we're looking forward to this really informative and entertaining episode. So Daryl, I think we were going to start off with, uh, you were going to read us some poetry, right? Yeah. Um, so here's a poem, and this is a poem by a 20th century American poet named Kenneth Rexroth, who I like quite a bit, and um, he could write poems about seemingly quotidian things, like going for a picnic with his wife, going for a hike, but he would really startle you with his imagery and his word choice where every line was a surprise. And for me, that's a big deal. Like um, uh, a poem has lines. Uh, uh, every, every poem, uh, you can write this down. Every poem has a beginning and an ending and every poem is made up of lines. And I like poems that have strong endings, strong, be strong beginnings and strong lines. And I actually vividly remember the first time I read the poem Alone by Edgar Allan Poe. And that's one of the things that made me want to be a writer. And it had everything I wanted in a poem. It had a great hook, um, great rhythm and meter, and a uh, kick-ass surprise ending, startling imagery. And when you read it the first time, it sounds like it's the, a real cry of the soul like a soul language pouring out his guts to you. But then as the years go by and you actually reverse engineer it, it's like, oh, it's actually bursting with craft and structure and all this thought, right? But um, he was so obsessed with the ride and having a piece of uh, literary art have this flow and inevitability to it where you don't see the wires. So that's a real vivid memory of reading Alone by Edgar Allan Poe and saying, that's what we're shooting for. Um, so yeah, Kenneth Rexroth, um, I'm a fan. And this is a poem called Growing. And I'll give you a spoiler alert. It's a love poem. He was really good at love poems. And um, people, people say, do we need more love poems in the world? And it's like, well, do we need more love in the world? Mm -hmm. Is it still a universal longing? Ah, go for it, right? Right. And um, basically in this poem, it says that, um, spoiler alert, um, love um, uh, is dangerous because it involves making yourself known by another, which means making yourself vulnerable. And... Um, that's kind of scary because towards the back of your head, you have the instinctive part of your brain. And for 4 million years, it's been working to make you flee risk. So, um, uh, and love is dangerous. Um, so you have this powerful survival mechanism which says, no, no, skip it, yeah. skip it. But it turns out love is still the only game in town. So we're stuck. Right. <laughs> so this is a poem called Growing by Kenneth Rexroth. Who are you? Who am I? Haunted by the dead by the dead and the past and the falling inertia of unreal, dead men and things, haunted by the threat of the impersonal, that which never will admit the person, the closed world of things. Who are you coming up out of the mineral earth, one pale leaf, unlike any other unfolding, and then another, strange, new, utterly different, nothing I ever expected, growing up 
out of my warm heart's blood, all new, all strange, all different, your own leaf pattern, your own flower and fruit, but fed from one root, the root of our fused flesh. I and thou, from the one to the dual, from the dual to the other, the wonderful, unending, unfathomable process of becoming each ourselves for each other. Mm. Wow. So many great images there. That last line, man, that was so great. Becoming each ourselves for each other. That's awesome. Yeah, and again, that's the difference between poetry and a newspaper article where you're trying to compress as much meaning into as small a space as possible. Right. And, and that's a pretty strong point, right? Where it's like, um, what are you here for? You know, right? <laughs> right. What, you know, what's the point, right? And, you know, what if the point in you being given the gift of life isn't to acquire or to have fun, right? What if you're here for the other? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we're here for one another, right? That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then I love that whole imagery too, that, that, um, that idea of how love is dangerous because because there really is no real love without a mutual vulnerability. You have to open yourself up to getting hurt. And I think the more, you know, I think the other, the other thing, not only about, like you said, how our brains are uh, conditioned to avoid risk and pain, um, it's just a normal thing. But, you know, once you get hurt, you know, you have your first love. The first love is the best because you, you're, you're oblivious and you, you fall in love and you think, oh, this is nothing but good. This is just amazing. And then, you know, as long as it lasts, it's, it's, it's heaven. And then when, it, you know, when you break apart, you have your first heartbreak and it hurts so bad and you had no idea you could ever hurt that bad ever. You know, I think everybody has that first reaction of, I'm not doing this again. This is not worth it. This was too painful. Right, right. But then, um, so yeah, there is sort of a, a built-in thing of self-protection, right? Like, I don't want to go through that pain again. And yet, uh, I think C.S. Lewis has a wonderful, he's writing more about grief, but, you know, he has the line about that, about the only way to protect yourself from that kind of pain of losing someone you love is to just not love anything and close yourself off. He said, but once you do that, your heart will become like a stone and you'll basically be dead you know, before you, before you die, you know, your life will end at that point. So if you really want to live, you have to love. And if you're going to love, you have to open yourself up for that potential to feel pain uh, and loss and all that. But that's just part of it. That's the way it works. Yeah. Um, you know, um, W.H. Auden, the great poet, um, he once said that a marriage, any marriage, even a bad marriage, is endlessly more profound, more interesting, more meaningful than a romance, even a great romance. And you know why? Hmm. He said, because a marriage involves a promise. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I um, I think it's interesting, man. It's really great. You know, I think when you think about, I think most of the time when people think about poetry, that probably is the first thought they have. Oh, poetry, it's always about love. And, and I think, you know, you get the bad rap because there's so much bad poetry, you know, romantic poetry that's all gushy and gooey and flowery. And I will climb the highest mountain and swim the, across the ocean. And, you know, it's kind of, kind of goofy but um but when you run across some poetry about love that's real like that one i mean that's that's such a great the kenneth rexrod poem is beautiful 
um, you know, then it's like, man, okay, yeah. I mean, what else is there? I hate to sound like Robin Williams and Dead Poet Society or something, but you know, there is a thing. Like, what, what's the point of 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 engineering or science or you know, you know, or any of these other things without love? I mean, love is what makes every what makes life worth living, and um, and yeah, poetry definitely is a beautiful way to express that. Yeah, it's funny. Like we've talked before about how how this guy named Jesus said, "Love your neighbor," mm-hmm. and um, pretty much everything we do all day is to distract ourselves from doing that, yeah. um, uh, because of our of the of the reptile brain thing and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and um, so instead of loving our neighbor, we make sure we vote for the right person right. or whatever it is, and. It's funny, like, it's been a while, and humanity has literally tried everything else. That's right. Right? You know, like, hey, maybe you want to try love your neighbor. No, 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 I've, I've, I've got a new plan, right? Let's just keep <laughs> on trying what doesn't work, you know? Yes. No, that, I, I totally feel the same way, man. Uh, <laughs> it, it really feels that way. The frustrating thing is to hear is what I see Christians are, seem to be the worst at that, like, we'll try everything else, you know, like, hey, well, I know Jesus said to do this really simple, I mean, it seems simple, I guess we don't do it because it seems simple, but honestly, it's really, really hard, Um, you know, I think you said that in the last episode, something about how loving your neighbor is really hard, right, it's, it's not an easy thing, so, um, yeah, it's like, you know, so instead of like, oh, yeah, so Jesus told us we should do this, and, and, um, but you know what, Bill Gates has this really great book on leadership we should read. Or, you know, the guy that founded yeah. Starbucks has this really awesome seminar he teaches on um, how to grow organizations. Let's let's do that. Like, <laughs> we'll do anything, like, you know, we'll, we'll do anything but the very simple thing. Simple on one level as far as, like, the instruction. But, um, but really, the only thing that makes sense and the only thing that really changes anything, which is to love to love each other. You know, it's funny that uh, that reminds me. There, there was one time, a long time ago, I heard about a survey they did at a seminary around here, where they asked the students at the seminary, "How many of you are interested in leadership positions?" And almost ninety percent of the people said yes. So think about an organization where ninety percent of the organization are leaders, <laughs> right? How's that going to work? Yeah, <laughs> and like. So there's 10% of people saying, okay, which way, which way we go? And 900 out of 1,000 people are, are like, follow me. Yeah. Right? That's stupid. It really is. It really is. And honestly, that, that's one of my other pet peeves, Daryl. One of these days, I'm, uh, I'm going to write a book about leadership because, like, uh, especially in the church, this whole, this whole um, fixation with leadership. Like, you know, when there used to be Christian bookstores, you could go into a Christian bookstore and uh, there'd be like at least one whole shelf or a row on Christian leadership. But go look for a go look for the books on Christian followership or discipleship, which is what Jesus talked about. And uh, you couldn't find it'd be really two or three books if you're lucky, you know. Um, and all the emphasis is on leadership. And again, it's usually not leadership the way Jesus talked about it. Like I would love to follow up that that seminary question. If ask everybody, step one, ask everybody at the seminary, are you interested in leadership? 90% come back and say, yes, great. Okay, we're going to go out here and wash feet. We're going to go pull weeds. Uh, we're going to, you know, paint houses. We're going to change oil for uh, all these single moms who can't afford to take their car in to get it fixed. Or we're going to buy groceries for them. I mean, things like that. They, they'd be like, well, no, no, I don't want to do that. I said, I thought you understood in leadership. That's what Jesus said. The greatest of all is the servant, right? Um, you know, because I've washed your feet. And, uh, and I'm your leader. You call me the rabbi. You call me your, your leader. That's what I am. And I just washed your feet so that you would get the idea. You should wash one another's feet. You know, but we even see it in the book of Acts, like the same, those same guys that he washed their feet. Right. And then taught that beautiful lesson to, um, like, I think, you know, probably a few months later, uh, less than a year later, this, you know, once, once everything's taken off and Pentecost has happened and all these people are, you know, jumping on the Jesus train and everything seems to be going great. Those same guys decide they're, they're too important to wait tables. 
So let's let's vote some other schmucks who are willing to do that little job because we have more yeah. important things to do. We need you to guys. be preaching. Yeah, we need to be preaching the gospel. And it's like I, I feel like you know th- there should be a little parenthesis there where like the Holy Spirit says or Jesus says, you know, hey guys, remember when I told you that the preaching the gospel was washing e- each other's feet and waiting tables. Um, and not to get too much into down this track, but I mean, what's fascinating to me is that these these guys, these schmucks that they vote to kind of do the little jobs no one wants to do, which is to wait tables. One of those guys was Stephen, and like the next chapter, he has this amazing Jesus moment where he preaches this amazing sermon. They the pe- people put him to death, right? They stone him to death, and as he's dying, he sees Jesus. He sees a vision of Jesus. He says, "Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing." I mean, he actually you know, has a mar- the first martyr to, to the, to the movement is, is one of these nobodies who wants to wait tables. And the other guy is Philip. And a couple of chapters later, this guy, Philip, who's willing to wait tables, um, converts the first non-Jew, uh, you know, un- the Ethiopian eunuch. And then after he baptizes him, he freaking teleports like, okay, Peter never teleported. Paul never teleported. Like he's just gone and God drops him somewhere else to preach the gospel, like in Samaria or something. So, yeah. you know, I think um, that's, I, I used to miss that, but I, now, now when I read the book of Acts, I, I notice those things like, yeah, I, I think we've been missing that point for a long time. The, the need to focus on just that simple, you know, humbling ourselves, loving one another, taking care of each other. Like that's really the simple thing of what it's all about. So you're saying teleportation is the sign that you're doing something right? <laughs> well, it hasn't happened to me yet, so I, I guess I have not. I've not reached that level yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not that. Uh, but I would love to enlightened. do that. Yeah. Well, it's funny about what you were saying there, where it's like, yeah. So Jesus says, "The first be last, last be first. and he says, "If you want to be a hero, wash a stranger's feet," which I'm sure I'm never going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so we see that Jesus likes paradox, right? Yeah. And uh, the thing is, most people don't. And um, you're allowed to play with paradox in art. And a lot of people um, say they like art, but what they really like is decoration. (laughs) Yeah. Like uh, Thomas Kincaid. Oh, gosh, don't get me off on this. Uh, uh (laughs) <laughs> like Thomas Kincaid or the Fast and the Furious, you don't go to the Fast and the Furious or Thomas Kincaid to be challenged, but to be comforted and to see some decoration, and that's it, right? But in but in great art, you do um, you are allowed to be baffled and remain baffled, mm-hmm. and there's nothing really wrong with that, right? Yeah. Um, and when you go into great art. Um, uh, it kind of doesn't have the same strictures that your real life does. How like in real life, you're worried about saying something stupid, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. But in art, you can ask these questions and have fun with it. Yeah. And um, the, and it's funny about how there's so many bad Bible interpretation. And it's basically, it's, it's pretty obvious to me that um, most people aren't good at reading. They're just not, right? No. It's like, it's like, I'm not good at running and I can confess that, right? Yeah. And I'm pretty good at reading because I've sort of had some training in that field. So you'll hear people say, um, I read the book of Romans, right? And here's my hot take on it, right? And like, no, it doesn't work that way. And you wouldn't be able to get away with that claim with any other piece of literary art. Right. Ever. Right. Right. You're not an expert. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's you know. exactly right. Especially the Bible. The Bible is so difficult because number one, it was written in a language we don't read. It was translated, um, you know, probably from the Aramaic into the Greek, and then from the Greek into the English, um, usually by a committee of people who typically have some kind of agenda as far as like what would they kind of want it to say, and um, and yeah, it's just very difficult. And then there's 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 um, especially Romans, man. There's so many things there that. Paul is writing in this style called prosopopoeia that most people don't even know what that is. And if you don't understand what that is, I promise you, you're going to misunderstand like 90% of what it's, what's in that book. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, really it's, uh, it's funny. 
I, um, I, uh, I've actually said to people that Roman should be boycotted. Yeah. Where um, we should have like a moratorium for, let's say, a century. Yeah. We're just say for a century, you're not allowed to read it. Yeah. And like, um, you know, like uh, Martin Luther, he was pretty sure that Revelation and James shouldn't be in the Bible. Yeah, I, I kind of would agree with them, at least on Revelation, that we'd be better off without that book. <laughs> well, do you know, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's actually not in there. Yeah. Right. Um, where they're like, nah, thanks, but no thanks, right? <laughs> And so um, if you go to an Eastern Orthodox church, every time you go there, you'll be told, um, be attentive. God is good and he loves mankind. Yeah. But you'll never get, you know, that Jimmy Carter is the Antichrist. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So um, and it's like you aren't tall enough for this ride. Right. Yeah. Like um, you said, Jimmy Carter is the Antichrist. Sit down. You can sit this round out. Yeah. But yep. no, like everyone's uh, uh, an expert, right? Um, yeah. Well, hey, you want to read us another poem? Get yeah, us yeah. So track. here's a poem. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, this is a poem called Broken Homes. And all my old landlords were there, clapping hands and trading business cards. Remember that leaning triplex with the rotted staircase? Back then, I'd black out for days. When I awoke, all the mouse traps were sprung, the cheese long gone. The telescope on the roof of the summer sublet was no match for smog, those hazy screens of sulfur dioxide. In the windowless basement, I'd panic, think I was late for work, then recall with relief I'd been fired months ago. Tried playing by the rules, looked for coins in the street, saved them religiously, believed in the power of compound interest until I slit my wrists and found wires instead of veins. A dirty trick. So many things we were never allowed to vote on. Now there's no me left, just ego's ghost a smiley face balloon caught in a tree and our lease on the sky is about to expire. Gnostic turned to caustic, mesothelioma lawsuits all through the night. So many corpse shaped indentations on so many mattresses. Daryl was here. Wow, is that yours? Yeah. Where, where, is that one in one of your books? I think it's in the next one. Oh, good. Oh, there you go, man. Sneak yeah. peek. I love yeah. the line, and you know I was going to say something about this one. I love the line, you slit your wrist and there are wires underneath and it was a dirty trick. I think that reminds me of like Philip K. Dix. Uh, he has a short story called Electric Ant. Have you read that short yeah. story? Yeah. You read that one? Sure, sure I have, yeah. Yeah, it's about a guy who basically does, do, that happens to him and he figures out, I forgot how he figures it out. I think he's working at a company he gets up in the morning, gets in his flying car, goes to work. And then I think um, the people at work basically tell him that uh, he's being decommissioned or something. He's like, what do you mean, fired? Like, no, no, you, uh, you're a robot and we don't need you anymore. And, there's, and he's like, no, I'm not. And then, so then I, somehow they show him and he's like, oh, crap. And then he gets home and he, re, he kind of opens up this plate in his chest. And uh, there's like this weird kind of uh, magnetic tape or something, rain rainbow kind of like a thick tape mm. spool that's moving in his chest. And he decides he wants to kind of, he, when he messes with it, he has this weird trip where like he pulls it or something and like reality shifts and changes for a few hours. And uh, I don't know, I just love that story. The whole idea of like, you could be, you could be an Android, you could be a robot and, and not know it. And then I guess that's a metaphor for something too, right? Sure. Um, uh, I was just thinking, I'd be really happy if my books um, were filed in the science fiction section. <laughs> okay, let's work on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, it's like I said before, J.G. Ballard said, it is hard not to write science fiction because um, where have you been? Like the world's getting pretty weird, Yeah. right? And... Um, uh, there's no point in pretending otherwise. Yeah. And um, 
Actually, that's a funny story. Like before COVID happened in 2019, I didn't write very much at all. And then I had this moment where I found a way to make writing fun again. And then so um, I said, man, that sensation of writing and collecting stuff and stringing it together is fun. But it's always so hard to get started. So what I started doing is I started when I was stuck for ideas. And it's like we said before. If you're going to wait until you have a good idea before you start writing, you're going to die of old age. That's right. Right. Before anything happens. Right. Um, so um, when I would be like, um, I want to write today, but I got nothing to write about. Mm -hmm. Right. What I would do is I would. Um, uh, and I did this for a while, for most of 2020, I would write down what I dreamed about the last night and make that the first line. Oh, great. Yeah. So um, basically, if you take a lot of magnesium and zinc before you go to bed, <laughs> um, that makes your dreams a lot more vivid and memorable. Well, I got to try that. It, uh, it uh, totally works. And um, you'll wake up screaming <laughs> and, um, you, and you won't necessarily have nightmares, but they'll just be really more vivid. Right. Wow. And um, so, so one sounds, time I it sounds like it's cheaper than mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, I don't know too much about mushrooms, but I could definitely uh, endorse magnesium and zinc. OK, go ahead. And if you and, and and if you go to the health food store, they're often sold together where okay. you where you'll see a pill called ZMA, which is zinc and magnesium together. OK. And, and if you take a bunch of that before bed, you'll be in business. OK. <laughs> Awesome. That's so, a great so, idea. Yeah. So then I had this one dream where I went to a party at my friend's house and he had a piece of paper and I said, let me see what's on the piece of paper. And he'd written on this piece of paper, the shortcut home took twice as long. Okay. So then I woke up and said, okay, great. I'm a trained professional. That's all I need. Right. Yeah. So, so I use that as the first line of a poem. And then the rest of it, once you start, you know, object in motion tend to want to stay in motion. Right. So once I got started, I had a poem. Right. And then um, I had a dream where I had a potted cactus and I knocked the cactus over. And when it spilled over and made a mess, instead of roots, it, 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 it had wires. Whoa. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. So is that where you got the idea for the line about slitting your wrist and there were wires underneath? Yeah, I think so. And I think I've used that same idea a few times now. And um, uh, I don't think I'm exactly repeating myself, but I am, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's like, you know how you, you, you don't say to Joseph Conrad, hey, you're writing too many stories about sailing. It's like, that's his territory, right? Right. And it turns out, well, this is an obsession I have. I think it's a real concern. Let's just go with it, right? Right. So, yeah. So I had that dream and um, I thought, yeah, I can work with that. Right. So um, I'm always kind of interested in that. And um, like I said, um, Philip K. Dick is a pretty tough slog. And what happens is I have like 24 books on of 24 books by Philip K. Dick on my shelf. And whenever I reread them, I always regret it. <laughs> Okay, we have to talk like, about Philip K. Dick one of these days because I, I I agree not all of his books are great, but I think there's at least four or five of them that I would say are great, and I have reread them, and they are better when I read. I still enjoy them when I reread them. See, not all of them. See, see, it's uh, yeah, it's funny. It's like um, I remember he has a book called The Zap Gun. Oh, it's that like, sucks. That 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 book sucks. See, but the thing is, <laughs> um, what I remember about the Zap Gun is there was like a government where they were basing their policy based on a, 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 the dreams of a guy who was writing a comic book or making a crossword puzzle or something. And when I think about it, I'm like, oh man, that's cool. But, but when you go back and read the book, it's like, oh man, I'm so stupid. I shouldn't have done that. I just wasted a day. Right? <laughs> but it's like, after you read the book, you forget all the bad stuff. Right. And you just remember like, oh wow, this government was um, basically strip mining this guy's dreams. Right. 
And I'm thinking, okay, I'll go with that, right? Yeah. Um, and it just seems like now with my poetry, um, I can touch these bases I want to hit, but skip all the jibber jabber that doesn't interest me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know. Have you read, I'm just curious, uh, in, in all of your Philip K. Dick collection, have you read, because to me, this is one of his best novels, Because and, and ironically, I think it's one of his best because it's so unlike anything else he ever wrote. So it's a book called The Transmigration of Timothy Archer. Have you read that one? Yeah, I've actually read all of his non-science fiction books, like okay. um, like like uh, like he had a book called the called the um, the bubble something, boy in a bubble or something, yeah. and a book called uh, uh, Confessions of a Crap Artist. Oh yeah, that one's that one's that one's kind of like a Salinger ripoff. I think he's trying to be Catcher in the Rye. I think in that one. Well, it's well, it's uh, it's, it's kind of funny. Like everybody wishes they were somebody else. Like mm -hmm. um, it, if you're a writer who has a lot of critical acclaim, you wish you had more popular success. And a writer right. with popular success wish you had better reviews. And that's just life. But the thing is, Philip K. Dick really did want to be a uh, literary novelist, very much like um, the guy who wrote the book Revolutionary Road. Can't remember What's the guy's was. name? Uh, it's going to bug me now. Revolutionary Road. Well, I guess I can Google it real quick. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was made into a movie, wasn't it? Yeah. Richard Yates? Yeah. Philip K. Dick really wanted to be like Richard Yates, right? And um, he had a few non-science uh, non fiction novels where he was really trying to shoot for that. And um, uh, I thought he did it pretty well. And I liked that. And, um, you know, the transmigration of Timothy Archer he uh, wrote that when he was um, uh, consuming a little bit less amphetamine than usual. Right. Then he used um, which, which, uh, which may have helped, right? Yeah. Where it's like, um, you know, in the, uh, the uh, book, The Zap Gun, in the year he wrote The Zap Gun, he wrote like four novels in one year. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So oh yeah, he went through a phase. I think there was yeah four, or maybe maybe more than that in a, in a single year. It was one after the other. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm not sure we want to talk about amphetamines too much. No, that's but, okay. Um, we don't have to do that. <laughs> then, but then in 1977, when he wrote A Scanner Darkly, you 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 can tell he spent a bit more than three weeks writing it. Oh yeah. You know. But you know what though, I can't get through that book. Um, I, I've tried to read that book several times and everybody says it's supposed to be one of his best until I watched the, the Linklater film, Richard Linklater did a film of it. I couldn't, I, that's the first time I ever got to the ending of that story. And I was like, Oh, that's a good story. But I couldn't, I couldn't get through reading it, uh, for some reason. Really? I, really, I wonder why. <laughs> I don't know why. Did you okay. like that one? I sure did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I actually reread the man in the high castle, like about, that's the other one. I couldn't, I couldn't get through that one either. You know, it, you know, it's so funny. People go on about how it's one of his best. And then there's a middle section in it where I'm reading this. And I thought to myself, my God, this almost feels like it was plotted. <laughs> we're like, this guy's doing something. And then he meets a guy and then 30 pages later, this guy comes back. What? And like, normally Bill K. Dick couldn't do that. Right. Because of the speed. Right. So, th so, th so there's a middle section where I'm going, wow, um, this is actually going to pay off now because um, this guy is competing for business with the ex-wife of his so-and-so. They're going to meet up here and blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. And then about 10 pages before the ending of the book, I'm like, man, you're going to do it to me again. I got burned again. Right. Yeah. And then the ending of the book, I'm like, oh, man, I wish I hadn't read that. So the thing about, I, I think I remember this correctly, um, and it's ironic that you point this out about the plotting in The Man in the High Castle. If I remember this correctly, the, the way he plotted that book was he, he was at the time, he was into this thing called the I Ching, which yeah. is kind of like a Chinese um, fortune telling thing where you kind of like throw the bones and read, read, read the signs and then you know, tea leaves or whatever. And then, 
And, and honestly, I think that's the, the book that he did that with, where like he would be riding along and he'd be like, okay, what do I do next? And he would do the I Ching and then that would be like, oh, okay. And that would give him an idea to do this or that, right? So, yeah, yeah, kind of um, weird. I guess this might be a prejudice, but I personally have really no interest in like psychedelic drugs or mystical stuff like that. It's, it's just like a, like a uh, uh, blank spot for me. And um, yeah. Well, I'm not either. Yeah. I, I honestly don't think, like to me, I, I think Philip K. Dick would have had these ideas with or without the drugs. Because he, even in his younger days, you know, uh, like Eye in the Sky, some of his earlier novels, he was still playing with what is reality and identity and all those kind of things. Like he, um, I think the, the, um, the speed he was taking was mainly just so he wouldn't have to sleep. So he could just like sit and write all freaking day. And that's how he churned out so many novels, you know, and, and so few, such a short amount of time. But I want to say real quick about Timothy Archer. What I, what I loved about Timothy Archer when I read it um, is that it's, what I mean when I say it's so unlike any of his other books is that for what, first of all, it's written in the first person. Almost none of his books are in the first person. Yeah. The main character is a woman. He, it's the only book he has where the main character is a woman. And I'll tell you why, because he did not know how to write women. All of the women characters in his other, all, every single other book he ever wrote, yeah, they're brutal. horrible. They're just, the yeah, they're, because they're patterned after his ex-wives. And, yeah. and he always had this kind of, you know, this uh, animosity with his ex-wife. So the women are always like cold hearted and Vicious. betraying and, or real thin characters, right? or just sexual objects right there. They, they're horrible. He writes women horribly. And yet all of a sudden in this book, it's first person, the main character is a woman. Um, and there's, and, and it's actually also about, it's kind of a true story. Um, one of his best friends was like a Presbyterian pastor that was, uh, he yeah. would sit and talk with him all the time and he died. And so it was sort of in, during the phase of grieving his friend that he kind of decided to tell this story of really about his friend who the pastor who had died and his attempts to kind of contact, I think it was a dead a son who had died before, before he died. And then after he died, um, the wife, I think was also like kind of contacting him, you know, uh, post-mortem kind of a thing. But um, yeah, I just really liked that book because it was such a surprising thing for me when I was, and I was like, I was shocked how well he did it. I, honestly, it's so unlike him. I almost thought, did he really write this? Did maybe really? Someone, maybe someone Whoa. sent him this manuscript and he like put his name on it because it's so different from anything else he'd ever written. I, I I don't think that's what happened, but I mean, it feels that way. It feels like I just can't even believe he wrote this. That um, That's funny because I remember um, buying that book when Vintage started reprinting all of his books in the 90s in this classic, in this classy looking cover with yeah. like shiny gold on it and i bought them all at a bunch and i remember reading that and just thinking yeah that's a good book sure yeah like i thought it was you know um like i thought there were enough things in there that i recognized as common interests he'd had where that thread had been his work previously yeah um that i could that i certainly didn't wonder if it was a ghost writer <laughs> but I mean, like, I mean, um, I do think there are bits in his writing when he's actually pretty good at dealing with loss. Yeah. 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 And he went through a lot of that in his life. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. so, all right. We've, uh, we've scratched my Philip. Oh, oh actually, we, uh, we uh, can't stop yet, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. You know how you mentioned uh, um, Eye in the Sky, right? Yeah. Like he had the book Solar Lottery, where well, they pick presents by a... Uh, where they pick presents by by a by a random lottery, yes. Which um, I think is an idea whose time has come. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, yeah. um, Go ahead. What's funny is when you mentioned those early books, um, Philip K. Dick always said he was really influenced and trying to be um, A. E. Van Vogt. That's right. Yes, I know that. Yep. And today. When you say that, people say, who the hell is A.E. Van Vogt? That's right. right? <laughs> I'll be honest. I only know who he is because I read that Philip K. Dick was a fan of that guy. That's all. I, 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 otherwise, I've never read any of that guy's books. Well, it's funny. He had some books that involved a lot of sort of alien contact stories where the aliens were really tricky. And he had some books where it was almost like a like a mathematical puzzle trying to figure it all out. And... 
What's interesting about that guy is to think that there were a lot of imaginative crackpot weirdos in the science fiction community before they synthesized LSD. Mm, yeah. And that, and that's kind of interesting. Like later on, um, you know, people would sort of look back and say, oh, you must have been high. And like, no, when I wrote this, LSD didn't exist, right? And yeah. um, uh, people always said to, 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 to J.G. Ballard, he must have done a lot of LSD. And um, J.G. Ballard did acid one time in his life, and he had a classic bad trip where he just sat there for six hours saying, I can't wait for this to be over. And that was it. Right. Right. And um, so, so it's interesting about how people talk about drugs and all these things when um, they kind of give short shrift to the imagination. Right. It's, where, it's, yeah, um, it's usually an attempt to short, shortcut something. Yeah. You know, where there's always these like non-creative armchair quarterbacks who will say it must have been the drugs talking or whatever, when it doesn't really work that way, right? Um, mm. It's like I'm a big fan of Albrecht Durer, and there was one time early in his career when um, uh, he heard that um, there was an armadillo coming to town. But by the time the armadillo arrived on the ship, it had been dead for a long time and decomposed. So mm. he did this engraving of an armadillo. But it looks like a Robotech <laughs> armadillo, like a Mecha Godzilla Robotech with all right. these like scales and lasers and stuff. Yeah, I love Robotech. Um, yeah, because he was doing his best. And early in his career, he did an engraving of a lion before he'd ever seen a lion. So it looks pretty weird. Yeah. Right. Like looks awesome. But looks pretty weird. And then later in life, the zoo in Amsterdam actually had a lion. So he ran there to see it. And then he did an engraving of that. Right. Right. And I just find that to be kind of a, a tribute to the power of the imagination yeah. to fill in these blank spaces where um, his imagination was a lot more unlimited than his actual knowledge. And they didn't have the Internet or travel. So it was just yeah. I, I just find it kind of inspired to see how the blank spots he, he could fill in with his imagination. And then when he caught up with with the with like reality, he's like, OK, that's a lion. Right. Yeah. So how, how did uh, the lion look, the, the, the version that he did before he'd ever seen one? Was it anywhere close? It kind of looked like more snake-like. Like it didn't have much of a skeleton. It was kind of like slithery a bit. <laughs> and it looked pretty awesome. Yeah. I, I can't, yeah. For some reason, I, I'm getting images in my head of Napoleon Dynamite drawing a liger. But I'm sure it would look oh, better wow. than that. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, yeah. it was a bit better than that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, man, we've actually been talking for about an hour, haven't we? Yeah, we'd better hire a uh, moderator or something. Yes, or I need a clock or something. So uh, we had planned to go on and, uh, and talk about um, another topic. Do you think we have time to jump into that or no? Yeah, sure. Go for it. Okay. So um, one thing uh, you and I have been talking about a little bit off and on, and we've alluded to it a couple of times, but this idea of kind of like Christian art and what, well, I guess in general, what makes art good or what makes good art but there's a sort of category of Christian art, which, as you mentioned, Th Thomas Kincaid, which for me, I call him the painter of trite. Um, not the, but people, he's supposed to be the painter of light. But I just, I'm not a fan of him at all. Uh, and it actually, the more you, the more you look into Thomas Kincaid and, and, and his style and how he produced the majority of his paintings, um, he didn't even paint them. He had like, a, he had like a factory of people that he had there trained how to paint, and he would come in afterwards at the end and just do little flourishes like. He might and then sign his name, but he didn't even Man. Do that, right. It was like it's an assembly line thing, and it was really just about commerce and selling, you know, really like you said, safe art, you know, entertainment, not even entertainment, just sort of like um decoration. I think that's a good term. So anyway, um, but that's kind of what passes for Christian art, like Christian music. I, I worked in Christian music for about seven years. I worked for a couple of different Christian record companies and distribution companies, and um, at the same time. I have a lot of good friends that I made at the time who were, who, who at the time were, you know, we, we called Christian artists, musicians that were bands and things like that. And many of them are still my friends. And I, and I think um, a lot of them really put out really what I would call great art, um, great music, um, right, almost in spite of the fact that they were on a quote unquote Christian label. But most of the time they had 10, the, the, those kinds of artists, those kind of musicians 
always had tension with the record company because the record company was counting how many times you put the word Jesus in there. And, you know, was there basically an altar call song in there somewhere? And like, and a lot of these guys were like, I just want to write a song. I just want to write good music. You know, I don't want to have to like write to a, a, a particular audience, which by the way, we all knew what the audience was, which was a soccer mom, you know? Um, it's, a, it's a mom, she's between, you know, 28 and 42, and she's got 2.5 kids. And uh, she listens to the Christian radio station, uh, you know, taking the kids to, to soccer practice. And uh, because that's who shopped in Christian bookstores and that's the main place, you know, music, Christian music was sold. And um, it's the reason why a band like Petra was constantly, you know, uh, the best selling Christian rock album, but, but not because kids who like rock music were going in and buying it. No, uh, because those kids who like rock music were not buying Petra. So why was it number one? Well, because the soccer moms and the grandmoms who went into the bookstores, who were the customers for the bookstore, would ask the music buyer something like, hey, my grandson or my son, he really likes Nirvana or Pearl Jam. What do you have that sounds like that? And the only thing that that guy who worked there knew to say was, well, Petra's cool. So uh, there's probably millions of copies of Petra CD still in the shrink wrap. Uh, somewhere. Anyway, that's my rant. But anyway, I, because I've thought about this a lot, here's, here's something that I wrote. I'm going to just kind of read this little essay that I wrote on this topic. And, um, and then we can, we can riff on it a little bit. So I, I, it's called reserving the punchline. <clears throat> the reserving thing, what? Res, I'm sorry, reserving the punchline. Okay. okay. And, and that'll make sense as I think, as I'm going on here. The thin line between art that communicates a scandalous truth and art that is sheer shock sensationalism is something that takes time to explore and courage to proclaim. When does art begin to confront the culture in the same way that the parables of Jesus perplexed and challenged and offended the culture of his day? When does art stop pandering to our basest desires and begin to challenge us to shrug off our complacency? Should it real art have the power to disturb and unsettle us? The truth is we don't know the answers because examples of this type of art are so rare in this day and age. But isn't this the sort of thing that our society desperately craves? Art that communicates to the soul. Look at how Jesus packaged the gospel when approached by Nicodemus. His response was, you must be born again. Now for you and I, thousands of years removed from this moment and informed by countless biblical commentaries, we understand plainly what Jesus meant. But for Nicodemus standing there in front of Jesus at that moment, the only response was bewilderment. He tried to get a grip on what Jesus was talking about. You mean I need to re-enter my mother's womb? He was grappling with this statement. He tried desperately to make sense of it and felt frustrated, challenged, and annoyed. And that's exactly what Jesus wanted. Jesus did not give him theology. Instead, he gave him something to chew on, something to exasperate and confound him. Jesus did something that very few of us ever do when attempting to evangelize. He engaged the person on a level that invited dialogue and thought. He allowed the person to take a concept and think about it for himself. When Jesus was approached by Nicodemus, he took a creative mode of communication that challenged the listener to actually engage his own brain. More importantly, he did not give Nicodemus the punchline. The gospels are full of these sorts of examples of Jesus' style of evangelism. What are the parables? It's not simple stories that cause you to ponder the deeper meaning beneath the surface. I think if more of us took Jesus' approach to the idea of evangelism, we'd be more effective, especially when it comes to creating art that transcends the norm. So here we get to the art part. Recently, I came across a great quote from a guy named Steve Turner about artists as prophets uh, in Image Journal of the Arts and Religion. Uh, quote, he says, one role of the artist is to provoke and even disturb us so that we can see in new ways as the ancient prophets did. Art frequently condemns the values and concerns of its surrounding culture, often in a loud, harsh voice. In consequence, the artist is often outcast, rejected, or unpopular. Maybe the problem is that most of those whom we call artists today are in reality only entertainers. But a true artist as defined above is one who challenges the lifestyle, thought pattern and behavior of a society regardless of what anyone thinks, even if it means risking being unpopular. Why don't more artists take the role of prophet? Perhaps because it's just more difficult. Perhaps because we're making some wrong assumptions. One being that to be quote evangelistic we must somehow spell out the gospel in plain English in a song or a painting. But the world doesn't want these things spelled out. It doesn't want the punchline. 
They've already heard the punchline in regards to what the Christian faith is all about so many times. What they want to know is, how does it relate to my life? How do I actually do this stuff? What value are the teachings of Jesus to my life today? Art has the power to ask these questions and to provide clues regarding answers. But the more important elements of the equation are the questions and the clues, not the punchline. Sure, it's easier just to look through an art magazine and take cues from what the rest of the world is doing. Maybe slap a cross here or there, a few nails, and presto, you got something that other Christians might call Christian art. But if your hope is to communicate something more potent and effective to the culture you live in, then it's going to involve submission to the Holy Spirit when you sit down to create your art. The finished product might not look on the surface like something that God could or would use, but as you continue to see God's face in your work, you'll begin to find more and more success at hearing his voice and responding to his direction. Now, having said that, um, I, I was, I was after I, I wrote that, around the time I wrote that, I was kind of looking for like, what, what would be examples of the kind of thing I'm talking about in, in that little essay? And the funny thing is that what I, came, what, I, what I came across was a work of art, not created by somebody who would self-identify as a Christian, but yet something that I would, I would look at and say is a perfect example of exactly what I'm talking about. So um, there's, a, there's a work of uh, art by a guy named um, Andre Serrano, and uh, it's called Piss Christ. And what it is is a photograph. And uh, the photograph is, um, first of all, if you don't know what it is, it, it's basically, if you just see it, it's beautiful. It's kind of like a, it's like Jesus on, on, you know, it's a crucifixion scene and it's Jesus on a cross and it's seen through this kind of amber gold kind of filter. And it's really kind of, you know, mysterious and atmospheric and, you know, wow. It's like, wow, that's really different. I've never seen anything like that. But what, uh, when you sort of read what it is, like a little card hanging next to it on the wall and it's a photograph, um, what you find out is that the artist, Andre Serrano, um, uh, supposedly, um, took a crucifix, stuck it, uh, stuck it in a jar of his own urine and photographed it. And that's what it is. It's called, and that's why it's called Piss Christ. Now, people got really upset. And again, this is what I'm talking about. People got very, very offended. Of course, the main group of people that got offended were Christians. Christians were highly offended at this. How dare you? This is so blasphemous. How could you put Jesus on the cross in a jar of your own urine. But I don't, when I look at that, when I consider what the artist has done in creating that photograph, to me, that's, that's a perfect metaphor for the cross, for, for the incarnation. This is exactly what Paul is talking about in Philippians 2 when he says, you know, that God, that Jesus was, you know, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, took on flesh, became a human being, not just a human being, but you know, humble himself then to be to become a servant to, you know, we've already talked about washing feet. And, um, and so isn't that what's happening, really, when we when we read about the crucifixion? Don't we see that Jesus has, has decided that he wants to come down into our filth, and he wants to identify with us, and yet he loves us anyway? Um, in fact, you know, we're the ones that nailed him to the cross. And yet here he is saying, I still love you, and I forgive you. Um, I mean, I don't really care whether or not Andre Serrano, the artist, intended that or not, but I cannot help when I look at that photograph, um, but to see the, the profound beauty of it, and it does provoke you, and it, it is scandalous, and it is a little offensive on one level, but if you just stop and think about it for a little bit, you know, uh, I think what you can see is that there's some profound truth there that's even more profound than just simply, you know, going to church and, oh, looking up at the wall and there's, there's a crucifix on the wall or something like that. So uh, I don't know what you think about it. I don't, you and I haven't talked much about it. So I'm just curious, you, any thoughts you have about that? Well, first off, I guess I should respond to your essay there. Okay, as well. um, please do. You know, you know, there's another poet in town, a couple of miles that way named John Terpstra. And I know he's been published in that Image Journal magazine a few times. Yeah. Yeah, which is cool. Um, and that's a great magazine, uh, by the way. That, that, that's also one of those examples of um, they, they publish, you know, sculptors, 
poets, photographers, uh, painters that are doing phenomenal work um, of, of the kind of the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so basically, I'd have to say that uh, Jesus was really good at telling stories. Yes. And and you can quote me on that. That's my <laughs> bold uh, hot take. Are you kidding? Jesus was good at telling stories. Awesome. Yeah. And um, uh, he actually reminds me of John Cheever. And this is something that was going to come up in a future episode where there's a technique called gapping that both John Cheever and Jesus are really good at. Where imagine you write a poem and then um, this is a thing non-creatives don't get. All the magic happens in the editing room. Right. And um, imagine you write a poem or, you, or a story, and then you go back and you just erase all this non-essential transitional stuff. Yeah. Like um, when I did a poetry workshop, people would bring me a poem, and I'd read it and go, what if you got rid of all of the uh, conjunctions, all of the connective tissue, like, and then, therefore, even I, right? Yeah. And when they did that, the imagery was more stark. Mm -hmm. And, like, you don't have to say, and then, because I know, I and and I know you're downstairs now, whatever, right? right. Um, and like there was one time I was writing a story and I couldn't get the guy downstairs. And I just couldn't find a, find a nice way to write this section of him going downstairs. So I said, wait a minute, skip it. Just say he's in the kitchen, you know? Yes. So, um, so, so just imagine you write a piece of literary art with all the stuff in there. And then you erase certain bits. So the audience has to do more heavy lifting and fill in the blanks itself. Mm-hmm. And that's when art can actually be haunting and memorable and stick with you because you're more participating in it. Yeah. So it's like, um, and this is something the Bible is really good at. Like you read the story of Samson in the Bible. It's crazy how, how, uh, how short it is. Yeah. Um, there's a bit where um, people try to trap him and he rips the doors off the, off the gate of the city and all this stuff. And, um, and, it's kind of told non chronologically, where he's where where they actually say something like he were the doors of the city, and, but the other people had been up all night waiting for him, and it's really strange. And what happens is you think about the story and it plays it like a movie in your head, and then it's like fifty words maybe, right? Yeah. And, and then um, you know the book of Jonah ends with a question mark. Yeah. Right. Um, where God says, uh, says 120,000 cattle, question mark, the end, right? <laughs> Best ending ever. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it's so crazy and so smart, right? Because yeah. you're reading this and you're like, well, what's the answer to the question? What was Jonah's, re what was Jonah's reply? And, and the narrator is, does that gapping to say to you, what is your reply? Right. It's like, um, it's like, I actually, yeah, it's like, are you, are you somebody, and most people I've found are not like this, but I, I I'm okay with ambiguity. Like some of my favorite films um, kind of have that ambiguity where they ask, they let you fill in the blank, right? Like I love, the, I guess probably the most famous one would be like the ending to Inception, right? Where he, he spins the top and then his kids come in and he runs outside and plays with his kids and the camera starts zooming in slowly on the top and then it fades to black. And then I, I know friends of mine that are so pissed off about that. Like, well, did the top fall over or not? I'm like, well, what do you think? And that's not good enough for them. You know, yeah. another one is uh, one of my favorite films. And this is an odd one, but I really, really love this movie. Uh, it's called The Lobster. It's directed by a guy named Yorgos Lanthimos. And one of the craziest, most creative and unique films I've ever seen in my life. I really love it. Really highly, highly recommend it. But um, it also ends with some ambiguity too, where... Uh, Colin Farrell's character goes into the bathroom. His his girlfriend that he loves has been blinded, and he decides that he wants to be blind just like her. So he goes. So you see him in the bathroom, and he has a pair of scissors, and he's looking in the mirror, and he kind of holds up the scissors to his eye, and then it cuts and shows his girlfriend sitting there blind, alone in the in the booth in the restaurant, and it kind of stays there for a while, and then it goes, and then it fades, and then you're like, well, did he do it? Did did he did he actually blind himself? Did he walk away and leave her there? Did he just give up and say, forget it? Or is he going to come back and pretend to be blind? I mean, there's so many possible things that could happen. And you're and it just ends that way. And you're sorry, spoiler alert. That's that kind of left not knowing. But I love 
I love that kind of stuff. It's more interesting to me. This is this is also odd because I got uh, I, one of my books I'm going to write coming up. One of my next books uh, I'm going to write is about mystery and the idea of embracing mystery and ambiguity and and all of that. And um, so I just rewatched. There's a TED talk by J.J. Abrams uh, about. It's called the Mystery Box. I really recommend it. You know, go check it out. It's it's a really great uh, little little TED talk, and he talks about that idea that you know. Um, the mystery, the not knowing is better than the knowing. I mean, just as an example, like when you watch the first Star Wars, you know, and Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, and they talk about the force and all, you get this really, you know, Yoda says it's between you and me and the rock and it's everywhere and blah, 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 right? That's all you need. And then one of the worst things that they did was in the prequels when they said, oh no, it's these things called mitochlorians that are in your bloodstream and we can do a blood test. Like, well, that sucks. I don't want to know that. That's like a detail. Yeah. I would better off without the detail. It's like, uh, or the or the show Lost. I love that show. Um, you know, there was this monster in the in the jungle, and, and they didn't know what it was. They hear sounds, and people would disappear, and you know, they find dead bodies and huge crazy sounds, and and uh, you know what? It was better when I didn't know what it was. Uh, the the more the show went on, and they actually kind of started showing you what it was, and then they showed you how it got there, and. Well, all that sucks. Like my ideas about what the monster was, was way better than what it actually ended up being. And um, so sometimes that ambiguity and that mystery uh, is way better. And, and I love, I really appreciate that Jesus is so comfortable with that. He's so comfortable with unanswered questions. You know, these, all these parables he tells and he doesn't, he only explains one of them, right? The rest of me just tells the parable and says, see you guys. <laughs> yeah. And actually um, that's how, how good art has to work to haunt. And actually, this is something Chekhov was really good at too. Like imagine, here's a story that has a skeleton that has all these beats to it and everything is arranged so it is inevitably leading up to this moment, right? The big payoff. And you end the story a semitone before that. Right. Right? And it's like, that was the genius of Shakespeare where the reason Shakespeare's tragedy is because he doesn't explain. Like when you watch Othello, you say, why? Why is Iago such a jerk? And then you think, why? Why does Othello believe him instead of Desdemona? Yeah. And because Shakespeare's a genius, he doesn't tell you, right? And um, if he had told you, that wouldn't be a tragedy. That would be like a melodrama. And it's like, when you watch The Godfather, it's like, hey, you just said you weren't going to turn into your dad, and now you're just turning into your dad. Why? And then, you know, we we can't say why. Welcome to uh, life, right? Yeah. And um, and also, like, the story of the return of the prodigal son ends with a question, right? Yeah. Where the father says to the son, are you going to join the party? The end, right? Yeah. And then the story's over, right? Yeah. And And there's no, you know... There was an answer to the story. The guy said something, but then Jesus took liquid paper to that part. <laughs> so he left that bit of the heavy lifting for us, right? So right, because it's a question, question not answered. Right? It's a question for us to answer. And I think Absolutely. That's, yeah. And that's why that was gapped. Yeah. Because if there's not an answer, it's uh for you to answer. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know, uh, my other podcast, Heretic Happier, we just did a we did a series a while back on 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 the parables. And um that was one of the fascinating things that in our discussion that kind of came out of that was like, um, I think it's the gospel of Mark. Um, is it Mark? Maybe it's anyway, whatever, whichever one it is, the gospels, I think it's Mark where Jesus tells the parable, or maybe it's Matthew. He tells the parable of the sower, which is the only one he ever explains. And it's near the beginning of the gospel. Um, and of course he explains that, you know, there's different seeds and one seed is good seed that falls on good soil. And some are the ones that are, they grow up quickly and then they fall away. And then, uh, so he does, he explains all that right near the beginning. And then the fascinating thing is that as you can, as you're the reader, as you continue to read the gospel, if you're looking for an example of the good soil, you don't see it there. No one, no one in the story is an example of the good seed. You have plenty of examples of the ones that fall away. I mean, even his own disciples run and scatter when he's arrested and, you know, they're hiding and hiding in the upper room, whatever. Um, and so it almost begs the question for you as the reader, when you come to the end of the story and you've never found an example of that good soil, it's sort of like, well, are you a good soil? Like, 
maybe you need to be the one who's the good soil because there's not one in the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, my favorite book of the Bible is the Gospel of Mark by far. Oh, yeah, and, me too. Um, it's so funny because in the modern era, in the, in the past, past few centuries, Mark has got such a bad rap. Yeah. Where people say it's the most primitive, the least literary, the blah, blah, blah. And people just don't get it, right? But there's actually so much literary art in Mark that people get blind to because they're not good readers, Yeah. right? And um, uh, and then people say, oh, if you want to be, yeah, if you want to become a Christian, read the Gospel of John first. Are you crazy? Right. <laughs> right? That's insane. Right. right. What I also love about the Gospel of Mark is that the original ending of the Gospel, Gospel of Mark, because the ending in the Gospel of Mark in our Bibles, and most Bibles will point this out, I think, um, if it's a good translation, it'll even tell you that, by the way, most uh, most earlier copies of the Gospel of Mark don't include like the last several. Yeah, verses. yeah, yeah. That it actually the, the, the original ending of the Gospel of Mark is, is exactly like we're talking about, like Inception or something like this. It's like Jesus rises from the dead, but many of them didn't believe the end. And, and you're like, what? How, that's a, that's a strange way to end the, end the gospel where you're supposed to be trying to convince people. But your ending is, yeah, but a lot of people didn't think it was true. And uh, I love that, actually. I, it's such a raw, bold, honest way to end it. Like, Jesus rose from the dead, but a lot of people, when they heard it, didn't think it was true. The end. Actually, um, I say to people, compare the, gospel of Mar compare the gospel of Mark to the movie A Bridge Too Far, starring Sean Connery. Yeah. Okay. That'll, that'll make sense of Mark. Okay. So basically, in the movie A Bridge Too Far with Sean Connery, um, the Allies are supposed to parachute in to a certain French town that's under Nazi occupation. But the parachutes, but the wind takes them and they land on the wrong side of town. Yeah. So they're behind enemy lines. So they have to kind of scurry and try to find a good hiding place, try to find allies, try to keep, a, keep, keep ahead of the man and all this stuff. And that's like the Gospel of Mark, because in the Gospel of Mark, um, Jesus is like a spy behind enemy lines. Yeah. Um, first off, in Mark, Jesus doesn't talk much. And I find people are more likable the less they talk. And in Matthew, he just can't stop talking. Right. And in, uh, and in Mark, he doesn't talk. So basically, um, in the first line of Mark, he says, this is a story about the Son of God. And then in the story, whenever someone says, you're the son of God, he says, shut up. Right. Right. So basically, so basically what happens <laughs> is. It, I like it. So, so basically this, this breathless narrator says this story about the son of God. And then Jesus comes to town and he does something amazing. And he says to everyone, don't tell anyone this yes. happened. Don't, you know, and then he just does something super duper. It says, don't tell anyone. And then he meets these demons and these demons recognize him and say, I know you. I've seen you around. But what are you doing here? Right. So this is kind of funny. Um, <clears throat> being a demon isn't a lot of fun. Um, so these demons, and these demons have a big limitation, right? They've seen Jesus around, and they know who he is, but they can't imagine what he's doing there, okay? Because there are some things demons can, can do but they can't imagine self-emptying love. Right. Okay. Because that's not their bag. Yeah. And, and it's like a, and it's like a foreign language. Right. Yeah. So um, demons are good at, you know, dirty tricks, double dealing, double crosses, you know, like how, you know, make a, make a pact with the devil. It never works out. Right. right. But a guy choosing to throw away his glory and wash feet, they, that's something that's like a failure of imagination for them that they actually couldn't think of. Right. And they, and that they, like literally, said, yeah, yeah. That thought literally couldn't occur to them. So they say, I know you, but what are you doing here? Right. And then Jesus says, shut up. I'm undercover. Right. Shut up. Right. Yeah. And then, um, uh, and then he goes to his hometown and people say, I know this guy. Who's he think he is? Mm-hmm. And then he does some crazy thing. People say, who is this guy? Who, who, who? And then at the end of the book, 
um, there's a Roman centurion who watches Jesus get uh, humiliated and stripped naked. And then he says that truly is, this was the son of God, which first off doesn't make any sense. Right. Because if, if, um, if you want to impress someone, you know, you, if, you know, like Tom Cruise, he flies a motorcycle out of a moving airplane and the parachute goes up. That's impressive. Right. Right. Being, being stripped naked and tortured, that's not impressive. Right. Yeah. But the Roman centurion sees this says, truly, this was the son of God. And the funny thing is, um, this is a good joke. Um, the Roman centurion's boss said he was the son of God. Right. So by the Roman centurion saying that, he was actually risking his pension, his paycheck, his livelihood. Mm -hmm. That's right. And maybe his life. If they, uh, yeah, yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. Um, I don't, maybe we'll have to come back to this, uh, this topic again in the next episode, because I think there's still so much we haven't, uh, touched on, but I think we've got de definitely got enough, uh, on tape here. Yeah. Um, sure. I'll, I'll just hold off a few big things, but just to clean house, like, sure. Yeah. So Jesus loves stories and he loved gapping, but most people don't and they want, things to be more mechanistic like an ikea manual or like romans yeah. well, romans was, was was written by a lawyer looking for an for an, for an escape clause and um <laughs> right. they want things to be more mechanistic right? right but um jesus is uh more human than that and the funny thing about the piss christ is that there was this ancient her heresy that said jesus wasn't fully man he was like a like a fuzzy white light and he was right. awesome, but he wasn't a guy. Cause come on, that's like kind of, kind of embarrassing. Right? right. And you can really understand where that's coming from because the Christian claim of the incarnation, like it doesn't make sense, but so what? Like nothing makes sense. Quantum physics doesn't make sense. So what? Right. Right. Um, but actually for me, like, you know how, how like people say the crucifixion, that's when you got your get out of hell free card and all that stuff. For me, actually, what's a lot more interesting is if you back up the train to the incarnation. Yeah, I agree. That's when everything changed. Yeah. Because um, that redeems everything. Mm -hmm. And, like, you can actually say to someone, um, because of the incarnation, you you matter. Everything you did today matters. Yeah. And it's not like, like oh, I wasn't a missionary today. I didn't save souls. It was a waste, right? No, no. Everything you did today matters. Because the like creator actually got down there and like joined in, right? Yes. So basically, by becoming matter, every piece of matter you can see is endlessly numinous and magical. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree, man. That is exactly right. Well, this has been great, man. I, I think we've we've hit a lot of really fascinating stuff. I've been trying. I always try to keep a log of what we talk about. So when I post yeah, it. Yeah. I can I can good luck. Like, yeah, but boy, we always we always we always go a lot of interesting places that I never expect us to go. Even when we ahead of time say we're going to talk about this and then we're going to talk about yeah, this, yeah, yeah. and we always end it, up. But I love it actually. I love that we uh, we get to go some interesting places. So yeah, this yeah. is great. That, yeah. yeah, next time I promise I'll 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 be good. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. not at all. This is good. <laughs> that is, I think it's very good. That's why it makes it makes it so interesting. So, okay, yeah, great. yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for uh, sticking with us and uh, yeah, well, hopefully we'll do it again next week. Okay. Take care. Great. All right.